Good evening. This is the uh, first of our Wednesday evening Vesper services that we do in this Lent. And again, we have our, our theme, Psalm 41. The order of service we follow is Vespers, page 229 in the hymnal. It is also printed in full in our bulletins this evening. Each of these services will have two psalms that we'll sing, including the second psalm being our theme psalm of Psalm 41. Tonight's theme verses, or the night's sermon text is verse 3 of that, of that psalm. And I think that's about it for special announcements. Uh, in the prayers, in replacing the Kyrie, we will do a spoken litany, which is printed in the bulletin. It's also in the hymnal on page 288. But um, opening hymn tonight is Glory Be to Jesus, number 433. We'll remain seated for the opening hymn and then rise for the verse.
Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him.
from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. O Lord, have mercy on us. The second reading is from James chapter 5. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The third reading is the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, drawn from the four Gospels, part one, the Lord's Supper. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called the Passover, drew near, and Jesus said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man will be given over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and scribes assembled with the elders of the people in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted how they might take Jesus craftily and put him to death. But, they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, one of the twelve. He went his way to the chief priests and captains and spoke together with them how he might betray Jesus to them. They were glad to hear him. He said to them, What will you give me to betray him to you? They promised to give him money and agreed with him for thirty pieces of silver. He accepted, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him in the absence of the multitude. Then came the first day of unleavened bread when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? He said to them, Go into the city, and when you have entered the city, watch for a man bearing a pitcher of water. When he meets you, follow him into the house where he enters. You shall say to the man who lives there, The master says to you, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house. Where is the room for me to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them. 
They came into the city and found it as he had told them, and they made ready the Passover. When the hour was come, Jesus sat down and the apostles with him. As they were eating, he said, I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I shall not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Truly I say to you, I will not henceforth drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of my Father. There was also a strife among them as to which of them should be accounted the greatest. He said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority over them are called benefactors. It shall not be so among you. He that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that serves. For who is greater, he that sits at the table, or he that serves? Is it not he that sits at the table? But I am among you as a servant. You are they who have continued with me in my temptations. I appoint you to a kingdom, as my Father has appointed me. You shall eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus knew that his hour was come to depart from the world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Already Satan had put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going to God. He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and girded himself with a towel. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not know now, but after these things you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has been bathed does not need to wash more than his feet, for he is clean altogether. You are clean, but not all of you. He knew who was to betray him. That was why he said that not everyone was clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me the Master and the Lord, and it is good for you to say this, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have done this to show you the way to do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know all these things, happy are you if you do them. I do not speak of you all. I know whom I have chosen. The scripture must be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Already now I tell you of this before it happens, so that when it does happen you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives anyone whom I shall send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, his spirit was in turmoil. He bore witness and said, Truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, dumbfounded about whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Simon Peter said to him, Ask of who it is of whom he is speaking. The disciple who was reclining on Jesus' chest said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, It is the one whom I shall give the piece of bread after I have dipped it. He dipped the piece of bread he had in his hand and gave it to Judas, son of Simon the Spirit. After the piece of bread had been dipped, Satan entered into that one. Jesus said to him, What you are doing, do quickly. No one at the table knew what the purpose was of what Jesus had said to him. Because Judas kept the money bag, some thought Jesus had told him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. When that man had received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. 
and in him God is glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify him in himself, and at once he will glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. For this I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but afterward you will follow me. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation.
mercy and peace you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for meditation today is verse 3 of Psalm 41. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. It's a text. Maybe see it. Dear Christian friends, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week on Ash Wednesday, we began walking through this psalm, Psalm 41, hearing how David said in the opening words of the psalm, Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed in the land. You do not give him up to the will of his enemies. And we kind of realized how the words of David in the psalm, this psalm especially, but many of the psalms, uh, speak, first of all, about our Lord and his salvation, as Jesus himself taught. I mean, that's what Jesus said about the Psalms in the scriptures. They bear witness about me, and some are even put specifically into the mouth of Jesus, including this, this psalm. You know, it's a little bit later in the psalm, but in verse 9, this psalm reads, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And as we heard in our Passion reading tonight, Jesus said that scripture was about the events that happened and fulfilled in him. But also because the scriptures are about Jesus, they are also about us. They are about you. We pray the psalms and we pray them recognizing that we are connected to Christ, baptized into Christ, and joined to Christ. So we hear these words of verse 3 and consider how they speak about Jesus and also about us. And our connection to Jesus helps us hear these words. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed in his illness. You restore him to full health. Now, many times when we hear these psalms, verses, and consider them about Jesus, it seems like they are a little bit out of place in, in um, putting them into the mouth of Jesus. I mean, we look at the Gospels, we never see Jesus really ever being sick, as it were. We never see him facing you know, illnesses, catching a coal, or even striking his foot against a stone. Uh, you know, it seems the Gospels are always showing Jesus healing people who are sick, but never needing being healed. And that's in somewhat in accord with how the scriptures do talk about Jesus, after all, right? Peter said he described him as a lamb without blemish or spot. He was uncorrupted by disease, partly because Jesus had no personal sin. But although he had no sin of his own, we shouldn't assume that he didn't have any consequences of sin in his body. I mean, this was part of why Jesus became a human being for us, so that he could do what John said about him, that he was the Lamb of God who take, takes away the sin of the world. In other words, the sin of the world was put onto Jesus. He was made a sinner for our sake. He put the iniquity of our sin on him, God did, as Isaiah put it. He became guilty so that we could become blameless and innocent before God's sight. Maybe one of the key verses uh, describing this situation is Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, that God made him, Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So because Jesus took our sin on himself, he took upon himself all the bodily effects of our sin, including the ability to die, most of all, but then also our diseases and ailments. Matthew even quoted Isaiah, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Isaiah even declared that Peter echoed a promise from God that would be fulfilled, will be fulfilled in our own bodies, not yet, of course, with his, fully, with his wounds, we are healed. You know, I was kind of uh, thinking about this as we sang so many of those Lenten hymns today, how many of them reflected on the fact that Christ takes, you know, our sicknesses are fulfilled in Jesus, which is why David could pray in another place, and we also can pray even in our own or 
uh, pain or illness, as we heard in the Psalm 103 this evening. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. This helps us see this word of the psalm, the Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. This was God's attentiveness to Jesus. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. It's an interesting depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus by Matthias Grunewald, is a, a, refer, a, a medieval artist, and he painted Jesus on the cross, not just, of course, nailed there and dying, but having on his body the, the obvious signs of the illness that was so plaguing the people, the plague that was causing so many people to die in his own time. In a way, it was depicting visually that Jesus really did take our illnesses on himself. I mean, this Jesus' cross was, in fact, a sick bed, suffering for us and our salvation. And as we heard in the psalm, the Lord sustains me on my sick bed. Uh, that word sustains can also mean upholds. God said in his prophet Isaiah, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Some ancient artists depict God the Father at the crucifixion, and of course he was. But how would you imagine, how would you imagine depicting God the Father at the crucifixion? What would he be doing? Um, I mean, the way that many times this was displayed was that the Father was behind Christ on the cross and upholding him and sustaining him there on that cross. You know, it, it may have seemed that God the Father was abandoning his son on the cross, but he truly and ultimately did not. And as the psalm proclaims, in his illness, you restore him to full health. Jesus on the cross did, in fact, die facing the ultimate consequences of our sin, but yet we know that God raised him up from the death and gave dead and gave him glory. And in that resurrection, God the Father restored full health to his son, setting him free from the consequences of sin and the burden of our illness and disease. And that resurrection of Jesus also is a promise to us, to our bodies, because he has joined us to him. Job, for example, prayed very confidently, after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold. When Job confessed his faith, I know that my Redeemer lives, he trusted in that Redeemer what he would do to his own body, facing the sickness and illness that he did. You know, the words of this psalm, Psalm 41, are also very much applicable to each one of us. We are baptized children of God, and the Lord sustains us in our illness, on our sickbed. God restores us to full health. God sustains us. What a great word that is. Uphold, he, he sustains and upholds us also in our sickness. I mean, because Jesus Christ is God's hand upholding us, being with us. Jesus of Nazareth is the hand and word of the Lord of hosts who does valiantly and sustains him who is weary, as Isaiah said. You know, we can remember this. You know, we look at ourselves. Look at yourself, and are you experiencing a measure of good health at this current time? What should be your response? To praise God and recognize that this is a gift of God. This temporary state of health is not something we have gained through our own effort or strength. It comes from the Lord God. Or are you or loved ones sick? 
Here, too, we recognize that we did not get this way because God has somehow overlooked us or neglected us or forgotten us. Indeed, whatever we face, we do so because it has been allowed to us by God's attentive grace and overflowing mercy who gives power to the faith and increases strength. Even when we, even in the times that we suffer in our bodies or struggle in our minds, Jesus is sweetness to our soul and health to our body. And even, even when we or a loved one die in the faith and depart in this life, that illness is not our ultimate death. We have the confidence that, this, that whatever disease might afflict us does not claim what is truly our life. In fact, we can remember as Jesus himself said when he went to the room of the little girl who had physically died and said, very truly, the child is not dead but sleeping. Illness, disease, death, they have no power over us because God's words are faithful and true. The Lord sustains you on your sickbed. In your illness, he restores you to full health. And maybe we experience that in part in this life, or maybe not. But the words are meant to point us beyond this life to what God has promised in eternity. And of that, we can be confident, we can be sure, and we can rest our hope and faith. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And may the peace of God pass all our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the Magnificat, the Canticle. Let my prayer rise before you as incense.
and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment, we poor sinners implore you to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. to raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed, to give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discourse, discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. Forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. 
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, O Christ, O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church, that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let your blessing be upon us, Heavenly Father, as we pass through these holy days in which we remember the sufferings and death of our dear Lord. Grant that this holy example be ever before us, we follow him in willing obedience, learn his gracious humility, and being filled with his love and spirit of self-sacrifice, learn the lessons of a life pleasing to you and helpful to all people. Through him who loved us and gave himself for us, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Jesus Christ, in the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, 